Welcome to Stories of Freedom. This is a podcast about discovering and embracing who you are in Christ. On each episode, you'll hear from people who have overcome obstacles, gained freedom, and found abundant life. Then we'll look back at each interview through a biblical lens and figure out what could apply to your life and your story, because knowing your identity changes everything. Thanks for joining us. We're excited to share these stories and biblical principles. Every believer needs to know who they are in Christ, how to fight the battle for the mind, and how to walk by faith in repentance. Stories of Freedom is a production of Freedom in Christ Ministries. I'm Dan Stute, President of Freedom in Christ Ministries USA. Today's guest is Beverly Wilburn. Beverly grew up in a difficult home, but her grandfather was a Baptist preacher who showed her the love of God. After his passing, she was looking for a Christian who showed the same kind of love as her grandfather. When she couldn't find it, she turned to atheism and professed that there was not a God. Years later, a friend brought her to a Bible study where she accepted Jesus. Now she's involved in Freedom in Christ Ministries and is passionate about sharing her story to encourage others. Here's Beverly's story. Well, hello, Beverly. It is great to meet you, and I'm excited to be able to share your story with our listeners today. Oh, well, thank you, Dan. It's nice to meet you as well. And I understand you already know Lauren a little bit. Well, I have not met her, but I've heard so much about her. I feel like I've met her. My mom's friends with Beverly, so uh, I've known her name for a while. But it's great to meet you, Beverly. Glad you're here on the show with us today. So, Beverly, as we were just chatting about, and as uh, your write-up says, you're uh, a writer and an author. You've written some books on grief and your working on a couple others. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about that and how you came to write those books on grief? Certainly. I had been involved in the hospice group of Midland, and I journal all the time. And I just sat down at the computer and just started writing, and it just turned into a book. And I shared it with my counselor at the time, and it was the suggestion that, hey, turn this into a book. So I started working on that and turning the process into a writing process. I actually wrote five books in eight months. I was shocked. <laughs> and each book was hard to write because it was so personal. But I enjoyed the process. At the time, I was not a Christian. That is how I got started into writing. So it really was just your personal process that you were encouraged to share with others. You mentioned not being a Christian when you started writing those books. Uh, We want to take a little bit of a look back at uh, your upbringing and, and what brings you to the point of our interview today. So tell us a little bit about your growing up years. Well, my grandfather was actually a Baptist preacher. We grew up listening to his stories from the Bible. He was a very quiet man, but he always had a lot of things to say about God in a very positive way. And as I grew up, I thought that that would be the route that I would take, that I would try to follow in his footsteps and and try to find a place to belong, you know, a church. And that just wasn't how it turned out. And I eventually, I became an atheist and um, totally turned away from any prospect of becoming a Christian. I just, I had decided that Christianity was certainly not what it was made out to be and that religions were just a way to control people's mind and I spent most of my time looking for ways to disprove that there was a God or anything in that nature. All of this happened with my family. I lost my family. And uh, an interesting thing, uh, my counselor was a minister. And on the first day that we met, it was like, I'm a minister. And I was like, that's okay. I'm an atheist. (laughs) It was kind of a kind of strange because you, you're you never sure of what type of response you're going to receive when you make a statement of that magnitude. But it turned out great. 
it just led toward my my journey with Christ. My counselor left, went back to Lubbock, another lady from hospice. She was a chaplain, and she befriended me. I was not aware that, that she was a chaplain until we met, and then some ladies and I that were going to the hospice group, we decided to attend Stonegate and go to the grief share program. And there was about seven of us, and we completed that program. And during the process, my new friend gave me a workbook that she said, you know, I, I, I don't know what you believe, but I wanted to share this workbook with you. And it just is the basics about the Bible. And so I was very polite, and I thanked her, and I returned home, and I threw it under the couch, and it laid there for about three or four weeks. Then it was just like it kind of called to me, (laughs) and I began working in it. I became obsessed with it. I was convinced that I was going to find some thread that was going to propel my direction more into disproving that there's a God, but that's not how it turned out. So then one Saturday, I was sitting on the couch that evening, and something kept telling me I should attend church, and I just had this ongoing conflict within myself, and I wound up at Stonegate. I actually pulled over at the parking lot where Academy Sports is, and I turned off my car, and I was determined I was not going, but I wound up there anyway a few minutes later at Stonegate. Then I wound up at the first step. I got a call from this young man named Josh Gatewood, and he and I met once a week, and we debated about God and about the authenticity and validity of the Scripture, of the Bible itself. Then he got me into this program called Alpha, and during that program, we went to a retreat at Mo Ranch, and that's where I accepted Christ. I was looking for something else that I wanted to be involved in, and two of the ladies from Alpha suggested Freedom in Christ, and so I absolutely said, yes, I'll do that, and contacted Valerie, and we began the Zoom for that because the class was full, so we did a Zoom. It was an amazing process. Wow. Well, we will come back to your experience with Freedom in Christ for a minute, but I want to take a step back and fill in a few of the gaps. Sounds like a lot happened there in those few years, really. You you lost your brother in 2016. You lost your husband in 2019. You mentioned losing your mom in 2020. That is a lot of loss in those few years. I can understand why You ended up writing on grief and how to walk with people through the bereavement process. But you mentioned debating with Josh and and going into Alpha. What happened? How did, I mean, it sounds like God was reaching out, drawing you into relationship with him, but can you fill in some of the blanks for us along the way? What happened to change your mind? I began to respect the fact that he not only used scripture, which was, to me, was useless. But he provided outside resources that I could research on the internet as well. Other public figures that I could read. And I thought to myself, and I actually found this journal entry from our first meeting. (laughs) I had thought to myself, well, you know, he really believes that this is the truth. And he seems like a nice young man. And I journaled that I'm going to continue to meet with him because this is an opportunity for me to move forward in my plan to disprove Christianity. And let me just say that I just was not very convinced at that time after the first meeting. (laughs) As we went on, he said, well, you know, I have a friend, Leslie, and they have this group that they're doing, and it's getting ready to start, called Alpha. He said, and it's people like yourself that have more questions and want to to know more. And I said, I'm not really interested, Josh, but I appreciate it. And then about that time, he said, oh, she just texts me back that she has an opening. (laughs) So I thought, okay, (laughs) my intention was to go and unload all of my negativity on them. 
as well. Then after about the third or fourth meeting, I started to feel like maybe they might be sincere. There might be something to it. I continued to struggle with the different things that we talked about and really actually believing those things. It's an 11-week program, and by about the eighth week, we went to Mo Ranch. I thought, well, I can handle this. And then Saturday was a prayer day, and I thought, okay, I won't attend that. But unfortunately, if you have not met this group of people, they can be very tenacious. (laughs) So I attended the prayer And I thought, well, I'll leave before they actually start the prayer. And just as I had all my weight on my left foot to walk out, Leslie came up behind me and she said, Bev, do you mind if I pray with you? And before I could say no, I said yes. And uh, and that's just how quick it happened. I mean, I actually was shocked myself. And it just continued from there. I think, Dan, that you hit the nail on the head when you said that God was actually seeking me or pursuing me, I think he had no intention of allowing me to escape. Let me just ask you a little bit about what you thought about God. I mean, you you were dead set on proving that the Bible's wrong. Jesus is not God who came in the flesh to die for our sins and raise from the dead to allow us to be alive with him. Were you angry at God? And if so, what got you to that point of being so dead set against God? I am a person who analyzes everything. I normally don't just take anybody's word for anything, and I I have to research everything. And I did that through this whole process. Even after I accepted Christ, I had to know. I just thought that it was just mindless to believe in something that you can't see, you can't feel, you don't even know really exists. Why would you believe and think that a book that existed like the Bible Sure, it's a great storybook, but what does it really prove? And I wanted proof. That's a very good question about, was I angry with God? About six months after I had become a Christian and I'd been baptized, I asked God that same question. Why did it take me so long to get to this point to accept you? And And so it was a few days, maybe a week later, he showed me. I was looking for the God that my grandfather talked about. Since I could not find that anywhere that I went, I couldn't find that spirit or that positiveness. I I mean, I couldn't find any of that anywhere. It was like people didn't notice if you came to the church. They were all about collecting money when you walked in. You know, they weren't worried about whether or not you believed in God. I had decided, and I didn't even realize that I had made this decision. I had decided that if there had ever been a God, he died with my grandfather. And I realized that that's why I became so ardent in my pursuit to prove that he did not exist because I couldn't find him. There's a lot wrapped up in there. I mean, losing your grandfather, somebody who is so uh, meaningful in your life, and then these experiences along the way of people not either leading with love or being gracious, understanding that you were wrestling, that you you didn't believe, that that's okay, that we can love you, uh, being patient with you. I think that's important for us all to hear because we all have neighbors and friends who are in that state. Some people may even be listening to this who are like, I don't know if I believe. And, uh, you know, honestly, some of the people that I know who say they're Christians are not helping me very much. It sounds like that was some of your experience is that there were a number of things along the way that caused you to want to say no. I'm not going to believe that. So thank you for filling us in there. I do want to move forward on into now your experience as a believer and what has happened since then. Lauren, do you want to ask her about her experiences with freedom in Christ? Yeah, Beverly, thanks for sharing that. And I I do want to say it's so cool hearing we were from the same hometown. I grew up in the town where you live and I know Leslie Crisp and I know Josh Gatewood. And so it's so cool to hear like that those are people that helped you get over that hurdle of where is this God? Where are the people that love God and love people the way my grandfather did? And it sounds like 
the people you interacted with were the ones that helped you get over that hurdle of, okay, maybe there is a God. And hopefully our listeners are encouraged by that too. And what you say and how you treat people makes a difference. The people you interacted with at Stonegate didn't say, oh, well, she's an atheist. We're not going to be able to change her mind like good riddance. They said, no, this matters and we care about you and care about where you spend eternity. So it's really cool hearing how big an impact they had on you. Thank you. Well, Josh, that is one thing that I still appreciate about his demeanor is he always accommodated anything I said. And he would say, that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked that question. Can you share with me why you think that? He is super smart. (laughs) I was just very glad to hear that because I had not had anyone respond to me in that way. And just having them and Leslie that whole group that she put together for Alpha, they are an amazing group of people. I am mm-hmm. so blessed to be affiliated with them. That's great. And and really that that approach of helping you even recognize what you think and thinking through that more fully, considering some of the questions like Josh and Leslie and the Alpha group did, is wonderful. Really because, I mean, I can't believe for someone and if I'm trying to argue them into the the kingdom, it can backfire. Now I understand there's a, a place. Uh, apologetics are so important. We need to know why we believe what we believe, and it's critical. But we also have to be aware of where the person is in their personal journey. It reminds me of a statement I heard from uh, Dr. David Smith in uh, Fairhaven Church in Dayton, Ohio. He said, grace is the bridge over which truth travels. And I love that statement. It sounds like it sounds like that's some of what you experience. Grace is the bridge over which truth travels. You are able to hear the truth once you experience the gracious love of the people that you are interacting with. So Lauren's going to follow up with some questions on your experience with freedom then. Once you became a believer, you know, what was hindering you and, and what was your experience with freedom? Yeah, I just want to hear... As you went through Freedom in Christ and Alpha, one of the big things that we focus on when you are going through the class and going through the steps is recognizing lies that you believe about yourself and about God um, and about other people. So I'd love to hear what are some of the lies that the Lord identified through this process and how did he change those lies to where you now believe the truth? In my conversations and my work with Valerie, she immediately spotted something that it took me a little bit to spot. And I mentioned to her and she said, I knew that all along. One of the hurdles, and I realized that as I prioritized different issues, this was absolutely going to be one that would be my priority, my focus in order to be able to work with the rest of them. And that was feeling worthy. And we discussed all of the reasons why I don't feel worthy, why I have that issue feeling that I'm not good enough. I'm not like everyone else because they're better than I am. And it it really was an issue for me to work through. Just accepting myself for who I am. And after becoming a Christian, you know, you hear all of these things that you need to work on. Oh, you don't want to do this and you don't want to do that. And just different aspects of the Christian walk that you're not familiar with when you're brand new. And the transition to going into freedom in Christ and then having all of these issues just, and you start looking at them and you're like, oh yes, that's, I recognize that in me finally. So you see where you can begin to eliminate these issues so that it allows you a true, really freedom. I mean, I really felt free when I could say, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm worthy of everything. Because God says I am, and he's trying to incorporate that into my lifestyle and and write that on my heart that I am worthy because of him. Something I think a lot of us um, have dealt with, a lie that a lot of us have dealt with, is not feeling worthy. Because the truth is, we're not on our own. We're not worthy. But he chooses us anyway, and he, because of his blood shed on the cross, we become worthy of that. So yeah, that's so powerful. Thanks for sharing that. I'm curious, how has that truth transformed your life? Like, 
the way you interact with people, what you prioritize? Like, how does your life look different now that you are learning these truths? I would say that the biggest transformation from learning to accept, just accept myself, is it allows me to feel free to interact with other people and accept them. I don't have a barrier there that keeps me from saying or doing something because I think, oh, that might not be right, or oh, I can't do that. That's not right for me to do that. I can just step out on a limb. It actually extended my faith as well because, you know, I'm not afraid to step out and do or say something that I want to say. And as it turns out, usually anything that I have to say It's a good thing. I don't have to worry constantly about conversation or interactions with other people because I have a confidence. It's given me a confidence that I didn't have before to be able to interact with others. That's really good. I have have one more question for you. If, say, there is someone listening to this podcast that is wrestling with similar questions that you were wrestling with, is there a God if there is a God, why should I give my life to him? What would you say to that person? How would you encourage them to take a step forward? Well, let me use an example. And I and I actually thought about this one, one time uh, when I was talking to God. And I thought, kids hate vegetables. <laughs> they hate spinach. They hate asparagus. They hate boiled okra. You know, we, we're always afraid of what we don't understand. We're always in fear of what we don't want to understand or what we are walking into the unknown. And yet we do all kinds of things that other people ask us to do that we shouldn't do. We go out and drink or we do, you know, we're not, we're willing to take that chance. And I would say that if you are struggling with whether or not you want to meet God face to face in a way that it becomes an experience for you. I would say, eat the okra, try the broccoli, walk out on your own, walk away from what everyone else's influence and say, you know what? I'm going to try this. We try everything else. If it doesn't work for you, then at least you tried. But I have a feeling that you will find out that once you say yes to God, you can't say no. Your illustration reminds me of of my kids who are now all young adults. And, you know, years ago when they were small children, they decided they didn't like something. But in recent years, we've said, why don't you give it a try again and see what you think now? And what you're saying is, no, really check it out. Give the Lord a chance to speak to you, to draw you in like he did with you, Beverly. Check out the claims that he has made. We have good reason to believe uh, there is that step of faith we have to exercise, but there's great reason to trust the validity, the truth of what the Bible teaches, and then the person of Jesus who meets us by his Holy Spirit and through the community called the church is very real and true. One of the questions that also comes to mind, too, is I'm assuming you went through the steps to freedom, and forgive me if I missed you talking about this. What was one of the powerful moments in that for you that you're comfortable sharing? As I'm thinking about the workbook and the work I did, and to just pick one, I mean, to me, to me, because this is all new to me, and it was all new to me, it's still new to me. Everything that I learn is it's just phenomenal learning about myself. And I think gaining the confidence from learning to believe in myself and allowing God to work in my life on these issues and having that freedom. I journaled, you know, everything uh, for that whole process. And I realized as I was journaling each part of development that I learned something new about myself. I started to see how God viewed me. We are so involved with how we see ourselves, even as we become a Christian and our downfalls, that we forget that that's not how God sees us. As Lauren was saying, you know, He has forgiven us and saved us. And 
he sees us in a totally different light. And as, as you go through each issue with freedom in Christ, you begin to see yourself the way he sees you. And it's hard to accept at first because you don't believe it. As you finish each process, you begin to see more and more how he sees you. And it just makes your struggles easier. It makes your walk with Christ easier. I'm not sure that I'm answering your question correctly. Well, I like what you're saying. I think uh, when Lauren and I do a little bit of breakdown at the end, we'll probably talk about this concept that you're talking about, which is essentially shame. Lewis B. Smedes, I think, said it's this feeling of of not good enoughness, you know, never measuring up. And Jesus scorned the shame of the cross taking our punishment. And Laura and I will probably break that down a little bit. But what I like in terms of what you're saying is that as believers on the other side of salvation, now we understand God sees us in an entirely different light because of what Jesus has done and because our identity is now as an adopted loved, forgiven child of God who's been redeemed by Christ, our sin replaced with his righteousness. There's such a tremendous transformation that takes place. And what I hear you saying is that you, in the class and in the steps to freedom, you are recognizing even more how God now views you because you have a relationship with him through your faith in Jesus. Absolutely. That's very well said. Thank you. I probably stumble across things and I'm not sure how they're coming across. And that's perfect, Dan. Well, I've had a little practice. So, and, I, and, <laughs> and I've had to wrestle through those things myself. Uh, honestly, I mean, I hated myself because I never felt like I measured up. And I had to come into agreement with God and what He says and in His Word that is true about me. And my faith is now not in my performance or how I feel about myself or even what other people say about me, but it's in what the king of the universe, who is all-knowing, says about me now that I'm in Christ. And you mentioned another, yeah, you mentioned another critical aspect of it is now he's helping you to live that, the truth of who you are in Christ, he's helping you to live that out day in and day out. And as we do that, Jesus says, we're a light of the world. We're a city on a hill. We can't be hidden. And as we learn to follow Christ, the light of Christ shines through us as we come to grips with how to live out this new creation that he's made us to be. That is one of the aspects of freedom in Christ that was so wonderful, is that as you're going through the process of eliminating all of this baggage, I'm, I guess you might call it. And then you're also thinking about how that you're supposed to be a light. It's like having a dam and all of a sudden you're putting holes in it and there's light. And then the more light that there is, the more holes that become. And pretty soon you just have this solid light that's coming through. And I felt like that was my soul. You know, it was covered with all this baggage. And as I began to alleviate each issue, a spot of light here and a spot of light there. Pretty soon you have light everywhere. And then when you think about, like you said, your your walk with Christ, oh my gosh, what a light you really do become once you are not focusing on the negative and you're focusing on the positive aspects that God has put in your life. Yeah, that's a great picture. I love that Colossians 1.13 that says he has transferred us from the kingdom of darkness, right, where that darkness prevailed uh, in our lives. And, and he's, he's brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. And so now you're shining that light of Christ. One last question, Beverly, unless Lauren has something. As a result of how you were raised and your stance of being an atheist, not believing there was a God, what would you say to people who experience that shame? What did you believe about yourself and your value as a person or even as a woman 
whatever you're comfortable to share, would you share with our listeners? I think a lot of of the experience that I felt about myself came from the fact that my mother, my grandmother, you know, they had these roles and that they had to fulfill and they felt no true worthiness. And I think as we're raised, that's how we turn out. I just experienced being around a lot of people that had anything positive to think about me. I'll share this one little thing. Back when I was in junior high, and this will probably give away my age, uh, they started having, having career counselors. And I remember I was from a poor family, and I was from the projects. And I got called into her office, and she told me, and I didn't understand it then, that, you know, I should probably not concentrate on taking anything for college because I would never be able to accomplish that feat, that I didn't have the intelligence. My background was not such that would allow me to contribute to economic or social stamina, you know, or of any kind, and that I should consider just doing the basics. Well, I didn't really understand then, and I certainly do now, and I think that as people continually bombard you with negativity, you can't help but feel defeated and feel less of a person. And I have always, as an adult, been a person who rallies around a woman's independence, a woman's right to be able to decide for herself who she is and where she's going and her worthiness. I think it's just who you associate with and the kind of experiences you have, and you don't know how to work through them, and that's what allows you to not see yourself as worthy, and you feel that shame for not being able to accomplish what you think other people are accomplishing around you. I hope that answered your question, Dan. Yeah, it does. And because I know some people will maybe even object to that word worthy. And part of why I say this is because back when I was starting to come to grips with these truths and talking about it, sometimes we think the idea of worthy means, well, I deserve it, or I earned God's favor, or I should have gotten this, right? Whereas what we mean in our conversation here today is we actually, Scripture says, we were by nature objects of wrath and deserving of judgment and rejection from God because we first rejected Him, right, in in terms of our sin and our, our, our sin nature. But He sent Christ, his son, because he thought we were worth it. I believe it was C.S. Lewis says, he has made us into the creatures that by his spirit are enabled to fulfill uh, what he has designed us to be. Of course, C.S. Lewis said it better, but he's, he's made us creatures that can fulfill his commands. So our sense of worth, our value comes from what Jesus has accomplished and what God says about us. And that is a tremendous sense of worth as opposed to uh, worthlessness. So hopefully that uh, is in agreement with what you're trying to say. Yes, and I'm glad you clarified that. Whenever I think of that, I always, that word, it's always in the image of feeling that you don't have any self-worth. And that you're right, as you go through freedom in Christ, you realize that that is how you're going to perceive yourself, because that's who we are as human beings. And as you go through freedom in Christ, you realize that that is not how God perceives us at all, because Christ has already turned that image around by his sacrifice, by salvation. Thank you so much, Beverly, for being vulnerable and for sharing your story. I'm encouraged. I hope that our listeners are encouraged just by the way that you're willing to step out in faith and you ask the hard questions and you didn't shy away from it. Good reminder for us also when we encounter people that are struggling with accepting Jesus to have grace, allow them to ask questions, 
allow them to feel what they're feeling and then offer truth. So it's a good reminder for me and hopefully a good reminder for our listeners. But just as we end, is there anything that you hope our listeners take away from your story today? I would hope that they step out and say, I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to step out and I'm just going to do it. I'm going to see if there really is a God. I'm going to seek whatever there is to find out about him. And I'm going to prove either to myself he is or he isn't. And I just wish them the best of luck. And I hope that they start that journey soon. Beverly, we're so thankful that you were willing to join us today. Oh, yeah, thank, thank you. you so much for hopping on the podcast. I loved hearing Beverly's story. So encouraging and so cool to hear someone that had rejected God and had decided, I'm going to prove that there's no God, actually ended up finding the opposite and is now um, living her life devoted to Christ and sharing the good news that she's received. Is there anything that really stood out to you about the interview? Anything that you want to discuss, Dan? Well, I think that concept of shame and the grace of Christ that she experienced in people, but also that God has extended to us through the finished work of Jesus is so important. I knew I grew up feeling shame. And I've got uh, one of our devotionals here, the 40 Days of Grace, which actually goes along with our grace course, which is being reproduced right now, will be released afresh this summer. But it says this, guilt lets you know loud and clear that you have done something bad. Shame, on the other hand, sends the message that you are bad, that there is something inherently wrong with you as a person. And I think I mentioned it in the interview, but just that idea that Jesus, like Hebrews 12, 2 says, you know, he scorned the shame of the cross, right? The punishment, the judgment, uh, even the separation from God that he knew would be temporary because he was bearing our sin and paying that penalty. But that was our born state. So it's understandable that we grow up feeling shame. And especially her situation she said she grew up very poor and had negative messages to compound that. And so many of us try and put on a, a smiley face when we go to church or out into public or power up and behave in such a way that uh, we, quote unquote, prove that we don't have anything to be ashamed of. Other people may give up, but in Christ, we've been transformed. We've been made new. Our shame has been covered. Our guilt has been paid. It doesn't give us license, but it gives us a new platform from which to take off and become the person that God designed us to be. What stuck out at you, Lauren? Mm, that's so good, Dan. I think for me, being reminded what an impact the people of God can have, what really tipped the scales for her, what made her change course is the people that showed her the love of Christ, that were the example that she was looking for. I think that it's easy whenever you hear like, oh, I'm an atheist. It's like, oh, well, they changed their mind or they're not going to change their mind or, oh, I'm just going to have to argue with them. And there's a there's a lack of grace that can be a big turnoff. <laughs> if, you're, if you're wanting to draw someone in, that initial reaction can oftentimes do the exact opposite. So it's a good reminder for me that like, how, how did Jesus interact with people? It was always with love and grace and understanding. He never made them feel stupid or he didn't argue with them necessarily. Maybe a little different with the religious leaders, but with people that came up to him and were like, hey, what's the deal? He he approached them with love and grace. And so that was a good reminder for me as I interact with people in my day-to-day -day life that the love is what really draws them in, not beating them in an argument. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. And, and there is that distinction between the religious leaders who were dead set against him and ended up judging, putting him on trial, crucifying him, you know, and he was very direct and very clear. It was almost like a verbal punch in the face at times, you know, woe to you, you vipers, you snakes, you whitewashed tomb. You know, I mean, he, he didn't mince words with those who needed to hear it straight and hear those difficult truths. But with those who were genuinely inquisitive, he was gentle. He was still direct and clear, but gentle, gracious. He didn't pull back, even like with the rich young ruler. He said he, said he let him walk away sad, but he loved him. 
The other thing it made me think of too, and really, as we talked after the interview, one of the things that struck me was Beverly's only been a believer for two years. And so she has such a humble attitude of saying, I don't know all the answers. I don't know if I did a good job explaining, but I I loved how she said, but I want to learn and I want to continue to learn. You know, John 9 talks about a man who was born blind, Jesus healed him. And he said, you know, freely, "I, I don't know all the answers. What I do know was I was blind and now I see. Right? And everyone has that testimony once they've interacted with Jesus. And, and Beverly is excited to be learning and growing and sharing her faith. And that's wonderful to see. Lauren, any last thoughts? No, I think that's all I've got, Dan. Thank you for, for sharing your thoughts. It's super helpful and encouraging to me and hopefully to our listeners as well. Mm-hmm. Thanks for setting this up, Lauren. Appreciate you. And we're grateful for Beverly and her being willing to share her story because it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Thanks for listening to this episode of Stories of Freedom. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And help us get the word out by sharing Stories of Freedom with your family and friends. To learn more about freedom in Christ, visit FICM.org or follow us on social media by searching Freedom in Christ USA. The links are in the show notes.